Hello, and welcome to World Canvas from International Programs at the University of Iowa. I'm Joan Kerr, and we're coming to you from Film Scene in downtown Iowa City. This is part two of our three-part series on the Arab Spring in a Global Context. This program is the first event of the 2015 Provost Global Forum, which is a multi-day international symposium featuring panel discussions, keynote addresses, and the presentation of papers, as well as numerous art exhibits and musical performances. In this segment, we're going to explore the social and psychological dynamics that were at play as the Arab Spring revolutions took hold and look specifically at the influence of the media, both old and new, on the evolution of the Arab Spring. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that you're invited to come to these live shows if you're in Iowa City, or you can catch them later on UITV, YouTube, iTunes, and the International Programs website, which is international.uiowa.edu. And you can learn more about Film Scene at icfilmscene.org. I'd like to introduce our uh, two guests for this segment. Just next to me is Sahar Kamis, Associate Professor of the Department of Communication at the University of Maryland. Dr. Kamis is an expert on Arab and Muslim media and the former head of the Mass, Communi Mass Communication and Information Science Department in Qatar University. Dr. Kamis is a media commentator and analyst, a public speaker, a human rights commissioner in the Human Rights Commission in Montgomery County, Maryland. She's also a radio host who presents a monthly radio show on U.S. Arab Radio, the first Arab American radio station broadcasting in the United States and Canada. So welcome. Thanks. Thank for you being so here. much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. And next to uh, Ms. Kamis is uh, Walid Afifi, professor and chair of the University of Iowa Department of Communication Studies. Dr. Afifi's research program revolves around the experience of uncertainties and their management across a wide range of populations, including Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Born and raised in Beirut, Lebanon, he was formerly a professor in the Department of Communication at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where he served as chair of the undergraduate program in Middle East Studies and was an affiliate of UCSB's Center for Middle East Studies. He also served as visiting professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the American University of Beirut. Dr. Afifi, a 1990 graduate with his BA from the UI, returned to campus as chair of the Department of Communication Studies in 2013. Pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, so, Sahar, I'd like to just begin with you. I think uh, we're all aware of the explosion of communications tools, the ways we interact with one another now through lots of different media, quite different from 10 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago. And um, the speed with which we can both send things out, receive things, try to process them, sometimes we get in the way of ourselves. Sometimes there's no fact-checking. Sometimes all kinds of crazy stuff is happening that we may believe, we may try to refute. It's a very different world in terms of uh, external communications tools. We were talking a little bit before the program began, and you said, all of that is true, but you know, people still pick up the phone and call each other. They still have conversations on the street corner. How do you see uh, conversation, communication, media as having affected what has happened during this period we're calling the Arab Spring? First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's indeed a pleasure to be here in Iowa for the very first time, my first time here, and to be part of this, uh, thank you, and uh, to be part of this great uh, conference on the Arab Spring and part of World Canvas as well. Uh, let me start first by talking about the role of social media or new media in general, and then talk about the role in the context of the so-called Arab Spring or Arab Awakening uh, mm -hmm. movements or uprisings in particular. Mm -hmm. I think that the presence of these new tools and means of communication that we call now social media, Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, has changed really the kind and pace and form of communication that exists, whether in the political domain or in the social domain. Mm -hmm. The name itself, social media, is interesting because they started first as social media. People would invite you to a party or you know, dating websites and stuff like that. I always tease my students in my Arab media course and I say, you can use Facebook for things other than dating and partying. <laughs> People use it sometimes to launch revolutions, <laughs> to change regimes in power. <laughs> you know? So think about these you know, so-called quote-unquote social media and how they evolved into some kind of tools for political mobilization and networking and connecting people in very serious manners such as political movements. And let me just pinpoint here the fact that these types of social media cannot really be put just in one parcel. They do have different roles and different functions. Mm -hmm. For example, Facebook is best for the purpose of networking and the purpose of having people join a certain cause. So for example, the We Are All Khalid Saeed Facebook page, which became one of the iconic 
uh, you know, features or really, uh, you know, parts of the Egyptian revolution that mobilized people. Mm -hmm. It started on Facebook and started to have hundreds of thousands of followers and people started to post on it and join the page and like the page. So it has this kind of snowballing effect to attract people and galvanize them to kind of really create this kind of catalyst for networking. Mm -hmm. Twitter is best for minute, on, minute by the minute on the ground. Uh, you know, organization. Mm -hmm. For example, there is this book which is called Tweets from Tahrir, whereby activists on the ground in the heart of Tahrir Square were actually documenting minute by minute what was going on in Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. I'm being attacked right now by the police. Send help on the way. I'm being tear gassed. I'm being harassed. Don't go to this street. Go to the other street. So it's a way really to kind of create minute by minute mm -hmm. on the ground mm -hmm. organization and documentation. YouTube, of course, is best for the purpose of citizen journalism, a phenomenon I'm sure we're going to be talking about a lot in the context of this conference and beyond, because it's the process whereby people take charge of documenting what is actually happening and going on in the, on the ground and just sending it immediately, not just to a local audience, but to a local, regional, and also global, international audience. Mm -hmm. If it was not for YouTube, we will have no clue what is happening inside a country like Syria where foreign journalists and correspondents are barred or really kind of prohibited from entering the country and playing the role as journalists. If it was not for YouTube, we would not be seeing all of these atrocities and horrors going on. Mm -hmm. So citizens with their own digital cameras and cell phones and held, held, handheld devices were able to capture and document these very important moments and send them internationally to an entire audience. And that's the, really the value of YouTube in terms of documentation. Mm -hmm. Blogs, on the other hand, are very good in terms of brainstorming. Mm -hmm. So if I want to brainstorm with you about, you know, what is the way forward, you know, for the so-called Arab Spring or post-Arab Spring countries or Arab Awakening countries, what are your ideas about reform in a country like Egypt? We can start a certain platform on political blogs and it can open a forum or a platform for discussion and for brainstorming and for the exchange of ideas around these issues. So although we put them all in one parcel, mm -hmm. we should also be able to distinguish some of these strengths or advantages of these particular types of social media and what role each of them can play best. Mm -hmm. Going back to your question, however, about you know, this social media and also comparing them to interpersonal communication, I do not see things as you know, a dichotomy, that you know, you're either on social media or you are either conversing or talking with people, because guess what? Even though social media played a very important and vital role in the context of the so-called Arab uprisings or Arab Spring movements, mm -hmm. we cannot ever deny or uh, you know, ignore the word of mouth and the role of interpersonal face-to-face -face communication. Mm -hmm. In the Arab world, there are still staggeringly high rates of illiteracy, mm -hmm. very high rates of illiteracy. And some people are not literate even in terms of media literacy or knowing how to use social media, or knowing how to use the internet. Mm -hmm. But they are galvanized and they are attracted by their own relatives and peers and friends who are more technologically savvy. Mm -hmm. And they kind of guide them into the process of how to use these media, but they also affect them through word of mouth interaction. Mm -hmm. So there is still a very strong oral culture an oral communication and interpersonal communication mm -hmm. still plays a very important and undeniable role especially if you're talking about small towns, rural areas, mm -hmm. there are whole you know, portions of the population that are not maybe on social media, mm -hmm. not on the internet, but they are able to be galvanized and networking through you know, organization and communication with their own peers and friends and neighbors. And that's how the word of mouth has an impact and oral communication culture is still very strong. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. We don't want to overestimate or underestimate the role of social media, but we want to see it side by side and in parallel with other forms of communication, including interpersonal communication. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let's think about traditional media, um, maybe government controlled um, television news outlets, maybe um, um, newspapers with long standing in a given country. Um, how did those outlets respond to these early, to these Arab awakenings? What, what kind of uh, reporting was done? What kind of reflection was given back to the people of what was happening on the streets? Very interesting question. And I have some funny uh, stuff to mention here. <laughs> <laughs> Egyptians, I'm originally from Egypt, have this great sense of humor that becomes even sharper in the case of disaster or crisis. Yeah. So whenever <laughs> things get very, wor you know, really worse, that's yeah. when our sense of humor shines. <laughs> you know, the things are really bad at this moment. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the heart of, you know, the Egyptian revolution in 2011, right, 
when people were being, you know, beaten up and tear gassed and, you know, uh, there's really all of this harsh conflicts and everything, you would turn to two different channels, Al Jazeera and turn to Channel One on Egyptian TV. And it's like you're talking about two completely different worlds, two completely different countries. You go yeah. to Al Jazeera and you see all the conflicts and, you know, the police is here and the army and their tanks and people are being, you know, beaten and tear gassed. And you go to the Channel One on Egyptian TV, the national TV, and you see the beautiful Nile. <laughs> it looks so beautiful, so romantic. You think that you are in Venice. <laughs> and I'm like, watching both, I'm like, are they both reporting from Cairo? <laughs> Is this the same city? Is this the same place at the same time, the same moment? Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So really, national media or governmental media has been under the governmental fist, the governmental control for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And that has not changed. They have remained very much under the control of the Ministry of Information in many of these countries. Mm -hmm. And they dictate to them pretty much what is to be written, what is to be shared, what is to be broadcasted, and what is not to be allowed mm -hmm. from being shown or broadcasted or written. Mm -hmm. So this has, of course, limited their credibility mm -hmm. in the eyes of the Arab publics because mm -hmm. the, the publics know very well that these are highly controlled type of media that they cannot really trust because they simply reflect the governmental or the official uh, point of view. To give you another example from Egypt also, you know, you can see, for example, things like Al-Ahram newspaper, which is the most important daily national newspaper in Egypt, semi-official newspaper. It has the headlines, you know, that at the beginning that this is just a conspiracy. When people started to go out to Tahrir Square, this is a conspiracy. Uh, you know, these are people against the, 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 welf the welfare of the country and so on. Mm -hmm. And the moment uh, Mubarak decides to step down, right? The next day, there is a big banner on the front page of Al-Ahram. The Egyptian people did it, right? <laughs> people were able to force the regime mm -hmm. to, to, to move out. People were able to succeed. The will of the people prevailed, and they kicked the old regime out. And I'm like, okay, that is not exactly what you were just saying, you know, <laughs> last week mm -hmm. or a few mm -hmm. days ago, right? Mm -hmm. So again, it is these very, uh, you know, sarcastic, bitterly sarcastic examples, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that show you that these mm -hmm. are very highly controlled media that have very limited credibility because of their uh, governmental uh, uh, you know, agenda. But let me tell you something very important in this context also. The role of citizen journalism has forced some of these, even the highly controlled mm -hmm. forms of national media, to start to address some of the issues that were very sensitive and somehow untouchable before, whether on the political arena or the political front or the social front. In other words, there was a spillover effect from the realm of citizen journalism into the realm of national media and national communication. They forced you know, the, the national media to talk about things like protesting, writing, uh, violations of human rights, uh, you know, corruption on the governmental level. These were issues that you would, you would not see in national media before. When citizen journalists started to blog and tweet and post and text on these issues, they kind of forced this agenda and had a spillover effect in the political arena, mm -hmm. and these topics started to, uh, you know, to be seen in the national press. The mm -hmm. same thing in the social arena. If you talk about something very sensitive like sexual harassment, mm -hmm. sexual harassment, for example, on the streets of Cairo, which unfortunately is a major um, terrible issue. It's shameful, but it's, it's there. You know, that is something that you would have never seen in the national media had it not been for the role of political bloggers and social bloggers who started to talk about it in their own blogs and on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube. And by doing that, they started to force this kind of sensitive topic into the national governmental media. Mm -hmm. So there is some kind of spillover effect from the realm of citizen journalism into the realm of national media. Wow. So interesting. Well, well uh, let's bring you into this, uh, Walid, mm -hmm. if we may. Um, you study something, I think it's such an interesting phrase, the experience of uncertainties mm -hmm. in life. Um, you, you research the psychological and behavioral uh, effects of uncertainty, but you don't know what's going to happen the next day, or you feel you have no control over your own life. Please explain it yourself, what this area of research is, and how it, how it might help us understand some of the things people um, living in the Middle East in uncertain circumstances are, are dealing with. Yeah, so I think one of the things that's important to recognize, too, is that... Um, uh, the experience of uh, people in the Arab street is in some ways very different, but in some ways very similar to the experience of citizens all over the world, um, including uh, issues going on right now in the United States, in Baltimore and St. Louis and everyone else. And I, th I think one of the things that we need to importantly consider, and I very much agree with what Dr. Uh, Soyaya was talking about in terms of dignity, these are issues that people respond to 
that are dignity based. I absolutely agree that it was a re revolution about dignity. Um, and those, uh, um, I just had a, a conversation in my class today about some of the things going on in Baltimore and the response there. And the, the, the reality is that these are uh, you know, responses that are not single episode, they're decades in the making. Mm -hmm. And they're not uh, single social media based, they're decades in the making, um, they're structural. And so I think as we think about and have this conversation, it's important to keep in mind that right now, throughout the world, including certainly in the, Arab, uh, in the Middle East, there are people whose lives are at risk and who are very much taking that risk to try to shape and change their their day-to-day -day realities. And so I think that's something to always keep in mind in uh, the comfort of our uh, Iowa City homes. Mm -hmm. um, the uncertainty is, is something that's, that's experienced globally uh, in, in, in uh, some parts of the world experience more than others. What I study is uh, senses of uncertainty about your well-being, your safety, your financial security, um, et cetera. So those are pretty large level uncertainties. But we also have day-to-day -day uncertainties about, um, see, you know, why is my 12-year-old daughter not back yet? I mean, these, you know, why, what is my husband uh, thinking about our relationship right now or my wife or my partner? Um, so one of the things that really is remarkable in some communities is that they're not only dealing with these basic day-to-day -day uncertainties that we all experience, uh, some very small, some moderate in size, but they're also dealing with uncertainties about their, their survival. And that's um, you know, how, how we are able to layer and manage those things, how that affects our communication abilities, I think is, is um, central to understanding how people respond. In other words, when we're so uncertain that we really don't know what's coming up next, does that empower us? Or does that um, you know, stop us from acting in any, in any way at all? And those are questions that, frankly, we don't really have answered. We hear about uncertainty a lot, but there's actually quite a limited amount of uh, systematic research on uncertainty. And so that's one of the things that I'm hoping to try to address a little mm -hmm, bit. Mm -hmm. So was there a need for some kind of cultural or, or social uh, change in the minds of, of people in these particular countries we're talking about right now that have, that have undergone a lot of um, um, public activism and so on. Is there something that's happened, do you think, uh, in terms of the way young people are, are um, perhaps taking the lead here with their parents' permission, perhaps, in, yeah. in the Middle East? Yeah. Um, so one of the things, every, every community, I think, has societal and cultural norms that shape a lot of the behavior that we see in those communities. I think one of the things that really struck me that I haven't seen, I think, sufficient analysis of in, in many circles is that um, you know, for youth to be taking the lead role on, in some of these actions and, and these revolutions um, required an implicit contract that had to get negotiated within families. Mm -hmm. um, these are communities that are, um, have very strong family structures, have very hierarchical family structures. I mean, one of the things that we do is study family communication. And the kind of interaction we see in typical US-based families is not at all with the kind of interaction that we would see in typical Arab families. Um, there's just uh, approachability and sort of respect that gets communicated in different ways that doesn't allow the kind of communication that occurs in different cultures. That has to be understood as part of any analysis that you do when you're trying to consider how did the youth um, spend days on end uh, revolting in a system where authoritarianism is, uh, is typical, where hierarchical structure is respected, where parents in the end of the day have authority over their kids, much more so than in other communities, there had to be an implicit conversation that allowed that to happen. And, uh, and in some ways, uh, irreparably or uh, irrevocably changed, and this goes back again to what Dr. Swayaya was saying, changed the realities on the ground for families. And once we understand better how that works, since the family really is the primary structural unit in the Middle East, that we could argue worldwide, but certainly it's the case in the Middle East, um, we can get a better understanding of what we ended up seeing, why the youth are taking the role that they're taking, what permission they did or didn't receive from their, from their parents, who themselves, the parents themselves, were often at very serious risk because uh, communities understood that punishing the parents punished the kids and vice versa. Um, how those all get, got negotiated, I think, is something that we don't understand enough and need to be uh, looked at more carefully. Mm -hmm. I need to comment on something yes. here in line with what Dr. Walid was saying. Mm -hmm. In the case of women, in particular, in some of the most conservative Arab countries like Bahrain or Yemen, which have also witnessed their own versions of these uh, you know, uprisings, mm -hmm. uh, women felt like it's a very safe domain for them to be more on social media and online, mm -hmm. sometimes then in the realm of actual on-the-street mm -hmm. activism. Although, of course, 
you know, these tandas also with heroic examples of going out in public, demonstrating side by side with men, mm -hmm. not being afraid to do so, you know, just facing bullets, facing arrests, you know, everything, uh, social stigma and everything. Mm -hmm. But some of the women I interviewed as well felt like this would be something that their families would find more acceptable yeah. for them that they can be online, sometimes using pseudonyms, sometimes mm -hmm. being with an anonymous identity or fake names, mm -hmm. which they had mixed feelings mm -hmm. about because they were like, if I want to be out there, I want to be interviewed by CNN at some point about my activism. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what one activist in Libya actually told me. I was like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? And she was like, but if I'm always using a pseudonym, they would never know who I am. Yeah. But my family would feel it's much safer for me to do yeah. that yeah. rather than use my real name mm -hmm. or go out in the street and actually face bullets mm -hmm. or face the risk, mm -hmm. of be risk of being you know, harassed or arrested. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, yes, the family approval was something that was important. And mm -hmm. sometimes they went against the family, even their own immediate nuclear family, and c kind of resisted even the parental yeah. authority or the family authority and took very high risks whether online or offline, on the ground. Hmm. And I think that speaks also to this idea of risk. They're not only risking um, their well-being for government action, they're risking their relational well-being uh, mm -hmm. connected to family. And again, in a community where family is, is uh, and the family name mm -hmm. is central. Mm -hmm. So for people to take on those risks, both familial, relational, and security, mm -hmm. I think really speaks to the sense of, uh, at what point do you get where you have, um, uh, such a response to the need for dignity, and you've lost your fear. And I think that's a critical component, again, that the Shoya said about losing fear. Fear holds us back um, in most situations from acting in ways that we, where we worry about well-being. Once that fear goes away, once there's a sense that I have nothing to lose, my dignity is lost, my family's dignity is lost, that is incredibly powerful. And one of the things that we don't speak enough of, I think, in this conversation is the Palestinian experience. Mm -hmm. Certainly communities that have uh, revolted against um, you know, a lack of dignity for a very long time um, and that in many cases have lost that fear. Um, and so that's really what it takes for someone to take that, those steps mm -hmm. of trying to free themselves of the structures in which they find themselves. Mm -hmm. You've what? recently done some research with uh, Palestinians living in Lebanon. Yeah, so we did yeah. some work in refugee camps, yeah. and again on issues of uncertainty and how, how actually mothers can um, help manage their uh, uh, kids' well-being and hopelessness. And one of the things actually that we found remarkable is that the level of hopelessness among uh, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon, which frankly, I mean, given that they have very little options outside of the camps mm -hmm. and their situation is very dire, um, that um, their levels, the adolescence levels of hopelessness was three times less than using the same measure of adolescent levels of hopelessness in inner city Alabama. Really? Now, you know, what does that say? I mean, I think, it, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know, I'm not sure what it says, Except, and I think there's a really interesting analysis about why. One possibility is, of course, inner city youth in Alabama may, have, may see possibilities for reaching things that they continue to fail, mm -hmm. and the Palestinian refugees that we surveyed recognize that that is not an option and come to recognize mm -hmm. what, their, what their options are. But another option that uh, I think merits some attention is the role of religiosity, the role mm -hmm. of family, and the role of, of a sort of community in giving them a sense of hope in cases that are, that are difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. This is, this is so, so, so interesting. And I, one question I have regarding the, you, you said that we probably, although it's gone on for many, many decades now, this Palestinian refugee crisis situation has um, gone on for such a very long time. And for many of us, I think, in the West, we looked at the Israel-Palestine situation as the one sort of confounding thing that may never get fixed or whatever. Now that so much has happened in Syria, Iraq, uh, what's going on now in um, Yemen and all of these areas. It seems to me that um, international press has sort of moved away from the Palestinian issue for a little while. What I'm wondering is whether in the hearts and minds of so many of the um, people in the, the Middle East who are now going through all of these uh, expressions of revolution on their own, how much is the Palestinian issue uh, integral to the way these, these people may be feeling? It's a fine question. Um, the Palestinians have been hoping for Arab governmental interference for a very long yeah. time. Yeah. And I think that hope is, uh, has, has faded a long time ago. But the Arab um, street, I think, is a very different uh, reality. Mm. Um, I can't, I'm not an expert in that, so I can't speak. But I can certainly, um, from personal experience, speak that the Arab street is, is a quite different experience in the Arab government vis-a-vis uh, -vis their response to Palestinians. But I think in the end, 
people are responding to their own lot in life. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, that's the situation that makes us act or not act. We may have a lot of compassion for another community. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I have a lot of compassion for, I could speak to a lot of communities. That's not what makes me risk family, relationship, mm -hmm. life uh, to act. So in the end, I think it really is local, even though there are global mm -hmm. affinities. Uh, in the end, it's a local that really makes people act. I did have one question for Dr. Khamis about this idea of social media and its impact, because the benefits of, of social media also turn to a, a record of what we've done. That's a permanent record, essentially, but quasi at least, could be permanent, and that governments have access to. So in fact, I mean, I'm a, I try to act on Facebook. I try to put, post some things on Facebook. When I go back to Lebanon, I have friends and family that says, Walid, you know, they're going to pull up your Facebook. They're going to see exactly where mm -hmm. you could be in serious trouble. And I don't consider myself at all an activist. I just post a few things here and there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's much reflection on the true um, you know, activists and how that, you know, the negative side of that in Absolutely. some ways, or the risks. I mean, thank you for asking this yeah. question. It's a very important one because there are indeed now what we call cyber wars. Mm -hmm. And these cyber wars are real. And just like the activists and protesters are sharpening, their own you know, uh, media savviness, if you will, mm -hmm. they're becoming more technologically and media savvy, so are the regimes in power. Mm -hmm. The regimes <laughs> right. in power are also building their own learning curve. Mm -hmm. So in 2010, before it all started, many of these regimes were clueless. Mm -hmm. They did not have a clue what's going to happen. In 2011, the Egyptian government was taken by surprise. The Tunisian government was taken by surprise. They did not know what to do. They panicked. They, you know, they pulled down the kill switch. We right. just turned off the internet for a whole week, you know, and it really backfired because people started to go out in the streets even in larger numbers and to look for their own, you know, friends and their own, peer, their own peers in the streets. And they started to find alternative ways to address public opinion, like speak to tweet service, whereby you can just call a number and feed your message to Twitter verbally, mm -hmm. and then the message will appear on Twitter even without any internet connection. So the governments did not really know how to respond effectively to many of these you know, high-rising stars, if you will, in the world of online activism. Mm -hmm. Look at the case of Syria. The Syrian regime was looking and watching what mm -hmm. is happening in Tunisia, what is happening in Egypt, and they were learning from it. So they started to be much more savvy. They started to develop their own you know, Syrian electronic army, right, which Bashar Assad was praising as like, right, it's yeah, doing yeah. a great work. <laughs> what it was doing is hacking these activists' websites, trying to hack the activists' websites to sabotage their efforts, to track their IP addresses. In some cases, people will face very serious consequences. Their accounts will be shut down. They may be even physically threatened or arrested you know, or beaten to death. In the case of Libya, there was this famous case of an activist who was literally on his computer sending opposing messages to Qaddafi when some of Qaddafi's men stormed in his apartment right. and they killed him on the spot. And his wife came online and she said, you know, I'm telling the whole world this just happened now. It's a terrible incident, but my husband has been you know, killed. Mm -hmm. And it was all online. Mm -hmm. So these are very, very serious cyber wars mm -hmm. between the activists and the protesters on one hand mm -hmm. and between the regimes in power. Mm -hmm. And each one is trying to race and to you know, build their own websites and Facebook pages, you know, scaf the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces when it was in power during the transitional period in Egypt. They had their own website. Ikhwan Web, the Muslim Brotherhood, had their own website. So every party and group on the political spectrum now is trying to sharpen their own you know, online and technological tools mm -hmm. and to enter this kind of technological race and be part of this quote-unquote cyber wars. But let me tell you also that there are some serious, serious threats now in a country like Egypt, for example, where I have some of my own friends changing their own names online. So right. I get this message from someone yeah. saying, I miss you. Haven't seen you for such a long time. I'm like, who is this person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean yeah. you miss me? I don't even know who you are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And then I discovered that this person has actually changed their name yeah, using a pseudonym response. because mm -hmm. they're afraid of being, you know, traced or afraid of being, you know, mm -hmm. hacked yeah. or, you know, being arrested. Mm -hmm. It's very, very serious. Yeah. So people are now hiding sometimes their activism and their online activity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for fear of retaliation and for fear of being traced and being attacked or hacked or even arrested yeah. by the regimes in power. It's very serious. Mm. Wow, well, you can see that this is going to be a very, very interesting week of discussions about uh, the Arab Spring and 
where we are now, five years into this, this period, um, I want to say a very big thank you to Dr. Kamis and thank to you. Dr. Afifi. Thank you so much for being with thank us you. today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, and uh, please stay with us for this third segment in our program this afternoon. Uh, it's going to be equally interesting. We're going to try to think about the global impact of, uh, of um, the Arab Spring with uh, two exceptional guests. So uh, you're listening to World Canvas, and you can find this program on YouTube, iTunes, UITV, and the International Programs website, which is international uiowa.edu and to check out Film Scene you can go to icfilmscene.org I'm Joan Kerr, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and we'll see you next time